It has been said that bartenders and doctors get the same clientele. The living and the dying. The Guy with the Eyes by Spider Robinson. Read by Carl Willis. Callahan's place was pretty lively that night. Talk fought Budweiser for most space all over the joint, and the beer nut supply was critical. But this guy managed to keep himself on a corner without being noticed for nearly an hour. I always brought in myself a few minutes before all the action started, and I make a point of studying everybody at Callahan's place. First thing, I saw those eyes. You could use just some haunted eyes at Callahan's. The, the newcomers have them. These remind me of a guy I knew once in Topeka. They got four people with an antique revolver before they cut him down. Hoped like hell he visited the fireplace before he left. If you've never been to Callahan's place, God's pity on you. Seek it in the wilds of uh, the Suffolk County, but look not for neon. A simple hand-lettered sign illuminated by a single floodlight and a heavy oaken door split in the middle. By the head of one Big Beef McCaffrey in 1947, and poorly uh, repaired. Inside, several heresies. First, the lies about as bright as you, as you keep your living room. Cahan maintains that people who like to drink in caves are unstable. Second, there's a flat rate. Every drink in the house is half a buck with the option. The option operates as follows. You place a one dollar bill on, on the bar. If you, all you have is, is a fin, you try across the street to the all night deli, Get, back, get change, come back, and put a $1 bill on the bar. Callan Han maintains that nobody is right in mind with counterfeit $1 bills. Most of us figure he just likes to rub fistfuls of them across his face after closing. You are served your poison of choice. You inhale this, sacrifice the option. You may, as you leave, pick up two quarters from the always full cigar box at the end of the bar and exit into the night. Or you may, upon finishing your drink, Stride up to the truck line in the middle of the room, announce a toast, this is mandatory, and hurry your glass into the huge old-fashioned fireplace which takes up most of the back wall. You then depart without visiting the cigar box, or pointing up another buck and exercise your option again. Calatown seldom has to replenish the, the, the cigar box. He orders glasses in such quantities that he costs him next to nothing, and he sweeps out the fireplace himself every morning. Another heresy. No one watches you with accusing eyes to make sure you take no more quarters than you have coming to you. If Callahan ever happens to catch someone cheating him, he per personally ejects them forever. Sometimes he doesn't open the door first. Not too surprisingly, it's a damn interesting place to be. It's the kind of place you hear about only if you need to, and if you're very lucky. Because of a patron, having proposed his toast and smithering his glass, feels like talking about the nature of his troubles. He receives the instant, undivided attention of everyone in the room. That's why the toast is obligatory. Many a man with a hurt walked inside finds in the act of naming his hurt for the toast he wants very much to talk about. Callahan is one smart hombre. On the other hand, even the most tantalizing cryptic toast will bring no prying inquiries if the guy displays no desire to uncork. Anyone attempting to flout this custom is promptly blackjacked by Fastity the piano player and jumped in the alley. But somehow, many do feel like spilling it in a place like Callahan's. You can get a deeper insight to human nature in a week than in ten years anywhere else I know. You can also quite likely find solace for most any kind of trouble. From Callahan himself and no one else. To a rare hurt that can stand on the advice, help, and sympathy gener generated by upwards of 30 people that care. Callahan loses a lot of his regulars. After they've been coming around long enough, they find they don't need to drink anymore. It's that kind of a bar. I don't want you to get a picture of Callahan's place as an agonized, alcoholics, anonymous type of group encounter session, with Callahan as some sort of salty, psychoanalyst father figure in the foreground. Hell, many of the toast provokes roars of laughter, or a shouted chorus, chorus of agreement, or a unanimous blitz of glasses from all over the room when the night is particularly inspirited. Callahan is tolerant of uh, uh, Ronnie Gazoo. He maintains that the bar should be merry, so long as no bones are broken unintentionally. I mind the time he helped Spud Flynn set fire to a seat cushion to settle a bet on which way the draft was coming. Callahan exudes at all times a kind of monolithic calm, 
and U.S. 40 is shorter than his temper. That night I'm telling you about, for instance, was nothing if not merry. When I pulled around about 10 o'clock, there was an unholy shambles of a square dance going on in the middle of the floor. I waited a on the bar, collected a glass of a uh, Tullamore Dew, and hello grin from Callahan, and settled back in a tall chair. Callahan of horrors bar stools to observe the goings on. That's what I meant about Callahan's place. Most bars, men only dance if there's ladies around, of one sex or another. I picked some familiar faces out of the maelstrom of madmen weaving and lurching over honest to God sawdust and waved a, 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 a few greetings. It was Tom Flannery, who at that time had eight months to live and knew it. He left a lot at Callahan's place. There was Slippery Joe M Mazer, who had two wives, and Marty Mathias, who didn't gamble anymore, and Noah Gonzalez, who worked on Suffolk County's bomb squad. Calling for the square dance while performing a, a creditable Irish jig was Doc, Doc Webster. Fat and jovial as the day he pumped the pills out of my stomach and ordered, ordered me to Callahan's. See, he used to have a wife and daughter before I decided to install my own brakes. I saved thirty dollars, easy. The Doc left the square callers to their fate, their creative individuality making a caller superfluous, and dressed over like a pink zeppelin to say hello. His stasis hung unnoticed from his ears, framing a smile like a uh, sun lamp. The end of the scope was in his drink. Howdy, Doc. I always wondered how you kept that thing so cold, I greeted him. He blinked like an owl with the staggers and looked down at the gently bobbing pickup between two fingers of scotch. Emitting a bevel of laughter at about force eight, he removed the gleaming thing and shook it uh, experimentally. My secret's out, Jake. Keep it under your hat, will you? He boomed. Maybe you better keep it under yours, I suggested. He appeared to consider this idea for a time, while I speculated on one of life's great paradoxes. Sam Webster, M.D. The doc is good for a couple of courts of Peter Dawson a night, three or four nights a week. But you won't find a better saw bones anywhere on earth. And those sausage fingers of his can move like tap dancing centipede when they have to, with nary a tremor. Ask Shorty Steinitz to tell you about the time Doc Webster took out his appendix in Tepa Callahan's bar, while Callahan calmly kept the scotch coming. At least then I could hear myself think, the dog, the doc firmly replied, and several people seated within earshot groaned theatrically. I have a heart, Doc, one called out. What a repulsive idea, the doc returned to serve. Well, I know when I'm beat, said the challenger, and made as if to uh, turn away. Why, you young whelp? I, 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 I ought to pop, poke you one, roared the doc, and a bar exploded with laughter and cheers. Callahan picked up a beer bottle in his huge hand and picked it across the bar to the duck's round skull. The beer bottle, being made of foam ripper, bounced gracefully into the air and landed on the piano, where Fastidy sat locked in mortal combat with the Sea Jam Blues. Fastidy made it sound like, like an a, a outraged transmission and kept right on playing though his upper register was shot. Little Beard never hoit a piano, he sang out as he reached the bridge and went over it like he figured to burn it behind him. Oh no, it looked like a cheerful night, but then I saw the Jansen kid come in and I knew there was trouble brewing. This Jansen kid. Look, I can't knock long hair. I wore mine long when it wasn't fashionable. And I can't knock pot for the same reason. But nobody I know ever had a good thing to say for heroin. Certainly not Joe Hennessy, who did two weeks in the hospital last year after he surprised, surprised the Jansen kid scooping junk money I had been safe at four in the morning. Old man Jansen paid Hennessy back every dime and disowned the kid, and he'd been in and out of sight ever since. Word was he was still using the stuff, but the cops never seemed to catch him holding. Should have tried, though. I wonder what the hell he was doing at Callahan's place. I should know better by now. He placed a tattered bill on the bar, Took the shot of burn which Callan had had on him silently and walked to the truck line. He was quivering with repressed tension and his boots squeaked on the sawdust. The place quieted down some in his toast. To smack! ran out clear and crisp. Then he downed the shot of him in a smelling silence and flung his glass so hard you could hear his shoulder crack just before the glass shattered on unyielding brick. Having created silence, he broke it with a sob. Even as he waited out, he glared around to see what our actions would be. Callahan's hands was immediate, and Amen! It sounded like an echo of the smashing glass. 
The kid made a face like he was somehow satisfied in spite of himself and looked at the rest of us. His gaze rested on Doc Webster, and the Doc drifted over and gently began rolling up the kid's sleeves. The boy made no effort to help or hinder him. When they were both, both, both rolled to the shoulder, phosphor and purple I think they were, he suddenly held up his arms, palm up. They were absolutely unmarked. Skinny as hell and white as a piece of paper, but unmarked. The kid was clean. Everyone waited in silence, giving the kid the respectful attention. It's a new feeling to him, and I didn't quite know how to handle it. Finally, he said, I heard about this place. And you must have needed to, Callahan told him quietly, and the kid nodded slowly. Can you get some answers in from time to time? We half asked. Now and again, Callahan admitted, some of the dumbest, some of the damnedest questions, though. What, what's it like, for instance? You mean smack? I don't mean bourbon. Kid's guy's eyes got a funny, faraway look, and he almost smiled. It's, he paused, considering, it's like being dead. Ooh wee! Came a voice from across the room. That's a powerful, good feeling, in, indeed. I looked aside with Chuck Sam's talking, and I waited to see how the kid would react. He thought Chuck was being sarcastic and snapped back. What the hell do you know about it anyway? Chuck smiled. What if people would ask him that question in a different tone of voice? Me? He said, enjoying himself hugely. Why, I've been dead is all. It's truth. Kinda confirms as the kid's jaw dropped. Chuck there was legally dead for five minutes before the doc got his uh, pacemaker going again. The crumb died owing me money, and I never had the heart to uh, done his widow. Sure was a nice feeling too, Chuck said around a yawn. More peaceful than that time in a, uh, a monastery. If it wasn't so pleasant, I wouldn't be so damn near scared of it. It was edge to his voice as he finished, but it disappeared as he added softly. What the hell do you want to be dead for? To Jansen, he kid couldn't meet his eyes. When he spoke, his voice cracked. Like you said, Pop, peace. A little peace of mind, a little quiet. Nobody yammering at you all the time. When if you're dead, it's not with your chance somebody will mourn, right? Rake fence with the worms, dig their side of it. Maybe a little poltergeist action, who knows? I mean, what's the sense of talking about it anyway? Did any of you guys ever want to run away? Sure thing, said Callahan. Sometimes I do it too. But I generally run someplace I could find my way back from. It was said so gently the kid couldn't take offense, so they tried. Run away from what, son? asked the Slippery Joe. The kid had been bottled up tight too long. He exploded. From what? he yelled. Jesus, where do I start? There was this war they wanted me to go and fight, see? In this place called college? I mean, they want you to care, to get care about this education trip? And you don't care enough themselves to make it as attractive as a crack, crap game across the street? Is this air I hear is unfit to breathe, and water that ain't fit to drink, and food that wouldn't nourish your vulture, and a ground outlook for the future? Can't get to a job without the car you couldn't afford to run even if you were working. If you found a job, it'd pay five dollars less than the rest. The TV advertises karate classes for four-year-olds and up. The president's new clothes didn't wear very well. The next depression's around the corner. You ask me what the name of God I'm running from? Man, I've been straight for seven months. What I mean, and in that seven goddamn months, I've been over this island like a fungus, and there's nothing for me. No jobs, no friends, no place to live long enough to get the uh, floor dirty. No money, and nobody at this point and say, Junkie, when I go by for seven months, and you ask me where I'm running from? Man, everything is all, just everything. It was then I noticed the guy in the corner, the one with the eyes. Remember him? He was leaning forward in rapt attention, his mouth a black slash and the face pulled tight as a drumhead. Those ghastly eyes of his never left the Jansen kid. But somehow I was sure his awareness included all of us, everyone in the room, and no one had an answer for the Jansen boy. I could see all around the room, men who had learned to listen at Callahan's place, men who had learned to empathize, to want to understand and share the pain of another, and no one had a word to say. He was thinking past the boarded words of a ha haunted boy, wondering if this crazy world of confusion might not, after all, be one hell of a place to grow up. Most of them already had reason to know damn well the society never forgives a sinner, but they were realizing to their dismay how thin and uncomforting the straight and narrow had become these last few years. Sure, they'd heard these things before, often enough to make them into cliches, but now I can see the boys 
reflecting that these were the cliches that made a young man say he liked to feel dead. And the same thought was mirrored on the face of each of them. My God, when have I let these things become cliches? The problems of today's youth were no longer a Sunday supplement or a news broadcast or anything so remote and intangible. They would suddenly become a dirty, shivering boy who told us that in this world we built for him, with our sweat and our own blood, he was not only tired of living, but so unscared of dying that he did it daily, sometimes for recreation. And silence held court in Callahan's place. No one had a single thing to say, and the guy with the eyes seemed to know it, and to derive some crazy kind of bitter inner satisfaction from the knowledge. He started to settle back in his chair when Callahan broke the silence. So run, he said. Just like that. Flat, no expression. Just so run. I hung there for about ten seconds while he and the kid locked eyes. The kid's forehead started to bead with sweat. Slowly, with shaking fingers, he reached under his leather vest to his shirt pocket. Knuckles white, he hauled out a flat, shiny black case about four inches by two. His eyes never left Callahan's as he opened it, held it up so we could all see the gleaming hypodermic didn't look like it could ever been used. He must have just stolen it. He held up the light for a moment, looking up his bare, unmarked arm at it. Then he whirled and flung it, case and all, into the giant fireplace. Almost as it shattered, he sent a telephone bag of white powder after it, and the powder burned green while the sudden silence hung in the air. The guy with the eyes looked oddly stricken in some interior way, and he sat absolutely rigid in his seat. And Callahan was around the bar in an instant, handing the dancing kid a bar that grew out of his fist and roaring, Welcome home, Tommy. And then one of the place was very start to realize that only Callahan, of all of us, knew the kid's first name. He all sort of swarmed around them and swatted the kid on the arm some and even cried a little until he poured some beer over his head. Pretty soon it began to look like the night was going to get merry again after all. And that's when the guy with the eyes stood up, and everybody in the joint shut up and turned to look at him. That sounds melodramatic, but it's the effect he had on us. When he moved, he was the center of attention. He was tall, unreasonably tall, never seven foot. Never know why he, we hadn't all noticed him right off. He was dressed in a black suit that fit worse than a Juliet special, and his shoes didn't look right either. From what moment, you realized he had the left shoe and the right foot, and vice versa, but it didn't surprise you. He was thin and deeply tanned, and his muscle was twisted up tight, but mostly he was eyes. I stir him with those eyes and wake up sweating now and again. You were like windows into hell. The very personal and private hell of a man faced with a dilemma he cannot resolve. He did not blink. Not once. He shambled to the bar and something was wrong with his walk too. He was walking sideways on the wall with, with magnetic shoes and hadn't quite got the knack yet. He took ten new singles out of his jacket pocket, which struck me as an odd place to keep cash, and laid them on the bar. Callahan seemed to come back from a far place and hustled around behind the bar again. He looked the stranger up and down and then placed ten shot glasses on the counter. He filled, filled each foot's eye and stood back silently, running a big red hand through his tinning hair and regarding the stranger with clinical interest. The drug giant tossed off the first shot, shuffled to the chalk line and said in oddly accented English, To my profession, and hurled the glass into the fireplace. Then he walked back to the bar and repeated the entire procedure ten times. By the gla last glass, brick was chipping in the fireplace. When the last echoed in empty air, he turned and faced us. He waited tensely for questions or challenge. There was none. He half turned away, paused, then swung back and took a couple of deep breaths. When he spoke, his voice made you hurt to hear it. My profession, gentlemen, he said with that funny accent I couldn't place, is that of advanced scout, for a race whose home is many light years from here. Many, many light years from here. He paused, looking for our reactions. Well, I thought, ten whiskeys and he's a Martian. Indeed. Pleased to meet you. I'm Popeye the Sailor. I guess it was pretty obvious we were all thinking the same thing, because he looked tired and said, It would take far more ethanol than that to befuddle me, gentlemen. Nobody has said a word to that, and he turned to Callahan. You know I'm not intoxicated, he stated. Callahan considered freshly and said finally, Nope, you're not tight. I'll be a son of a bitch, but you're not tight. The stranger nodded thanks, spoke thereafter directly to Callahan. I'm here now three days. 
In two hours I, sh I should be finished. When I'm finished I shall go home. After I've gone your planet will be vaporized. I've accumulated data which will ensure the annihilation of your species when they are assimilated by my masters. To them you will seem as cancerous cells, indeed you are affecting all you touch. You will not be permitted to exist. You will be cured. And I repent me of my profession. Maybe I wouldn't have believed it anywhere else, but a cow has place that anything, anything can happen. Yeah, we all believed him. Fast Eddie sang out, Anything we can do about it? He was serious for sure. You can tell with Fast Eddie. I am helpless, the giant alien said dispassionately. I contain installations which are beyond my influencing, or yours. They have recorded all the data I've perceived in these three days. In two hours, a preset mechanism will be triggered and will transmit by their contents to, what, to the Masters. I looked at my watch. It was 11.15. The conclusions of the Masters are foregone. I cannot prevent the, the transmission. I cannot even attempt to. I am counter-programmed. Why are you in the slide of work if it bugs you so much? Callahan wanted to know. No hostility, no panic. He was trying to understand. I am accustomed to take pride in my work, the alien said. I make safe the pace of the masters. They must not be threatened by warlike species. I go before to identify nature and to see to its neutralization, I think. It is a good profession, I thought. What changed your mind? asked Doc Webster sympathetically. This place, this bar place we are in, this is not like the rest I have seen. Outsider hatred, competition, morals elevated to the status of ethics, prejudices elevated to the status of morals, whims elevated to the status of prejudices, all things with which I am wearily familiar, the classic symptoms of disease. But here is difference. Here in this place I sense qualities, attributes I did not know your species possessed. Attributes with ever else in the known universe are mutually exclusive to the things I have perceived here tonight. They are good things. They cause me great anguish for your passing. They fill me with hurt. Oh, that I might light down my Gaius, he cried. I did not know you had love. In the echoing stillness, Callahan said simply, Sure we do, son. It's maybe spread a little thin these days, but we've got it all right. Sure it would be a shame if all went up in smoke. Looked down the rye bottle he still held in his big hand and absently drank back off a couple inches. Any chances that your masters might feel the same way? None. Even I can still see they must be destroyed if the masters are to be saved. But the first time in some thousands of years I regret about my, my profession. I fear I can do no more. No way you can, you can give up the works? None. So long as I'm alive and conscious, the submission will take place. I cannot assemble the volition to stop it. I have said, I am counter-programmed. I saw Noah Gonzalez's expression soften, heard him say, Jesus, buddy, that's hard lines. A mumbled agreement rose and Cal had nodded slowly. That's tough, brother. I wouldn't want to be in your shoes. Looked at us with absolute astonishment. The hurt in those terrible eyes of his mixed now with bewilderment. Short had him another drink and looked, it was like he didn't know what to do with it. You tell us how much it will take, mister, Shorty says respectively, and we'll get you drunk. The tall man with starburn skin groaned from deep within himself and backed away until the fireplace contained him. He and the flames ignored each other, and no one found it unsurprising. What is your matter, he cried. Why are you not destroying me? You fools, you need only destroy me and you're saved. I am your judge, your jury, your executioner. You didn't ask for the job, Shorty said gently. Ain't your doing. But you do not understand. My data are not transmitted. The masters would assume my destruction and avoid the system forever. Only the equal or superior of a master can overtime my offenses, but I can control them. I will not use them. Do you comprehend me? I will not act about my defenses. You can destroy me, save yourself and your species, and I will not hinder you. Kill me! He shrieked. There was a long, long pause, maybe a second or two. And then Calhoun points to the drink Shorty still held out and growled, You better drink that, friend. You need it. Talking of killing in my joint. Wash, our, wash your mouth out with fire bourbon and get out of that fireplace. I want to use it. Yeah, me too, can they cry on all sides. And the big guy looked like he was going to cry. Conversation started up again. Fast as he began playing, I don't want to set the world on fire. In very bad taste indeed. 
Some of the boys wander thoughtfully out, going home to tell their families or settle their affairs. The rest of us, lacking either concern, just never to console the alien. I mean, where else would I want to be on Judgment Day? He was sitting down there with booze of all kinds on the table before him. He looked it up at us like a wounded giant. But none of us knew how to begin. A cowhand spoke first. Never to tell us your name, friend. He went and looked startled and he sat absolutely still, bridges at a fence post for a long, long moment. His face twisted up awful, as though he was waging some titanic inner battle on himself, and cords and muscles stood up on his neck in what didn't seem to be the right places. Doc Webster began to talk to himself softly. The kneeling went all blue and shivered like a steel cable under strain, and very suddenly relaxed all over with an audible gasp. He twisted his shoulders experimentally a few times, he was making sure they were still there. Then he turned to Calhoun and said, Queer Isabel, My name is Michael Finn. Had tongue suspended in the air for a very long time while we all stood petrified, suspended. Then Calhoun's face split in the wide grin and he bellowed, Why, of course, why, yes, of course, Mickey Finn. Didn't recognize you for a moment, Mr. Finn, as he trotted behind the bar. His big hands worked busily beneath the counter, and as he emerged with a tall glass of dark fluid, the last of us got it. We made way eagerly as the Callahan slipped the glass down before the alien and stood back with the utmost deference and respect. He regarded us for a moment, and to see his eyes now was to feel warm and proud. With all the despair and guilt and anguish and horror, but most of all the hopelessness, were gone from them now, and they were just eyes, just like yours and mine. Then we raised his glass and waited, and we all drank with him. Before the last glass was empty, his head hit the table like an anvil. We had to pick him up and carry him to the back room where Callahan keeps a cot, and you know, he was heavy. And he snored in three stages. The End